It has been a pleasure to meet you, and it is amazing to see that there's this many people here at this event. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually very warming. I'm, I'm sorry I haven't come more often. Um, because um, probably what you Googled was an article I wrote uh, many years ago now when I was at Frog Design. And I actually still get an amazing amount of email about this, which says to me, the reason you're all here is resonate with a lot of people out there in the world. We care. We really do care. We care personally about the people in our lives that are 50 plus. But we also just, you empirically care because you kind of know somewhere in the back of your head, you're going to be asked to wear that shoe someday. And you're like, no, 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 not doing it. Um, I also love that when I pull this up for a screenshot, like the ads now, like, Acura, and sexy. It's pretty funny. Um, but you know, my point in writing this was I had started working at Frog on, um, on diabetes, on, on glucose monitors. And that client um, would say incredibly offensive things about people. And, and they didn't mean it. I mean, they were their customers. They liked their customers. But, oh, you know, well, a uh, smart meter makes a dumb patient. Oh, well, I don't know if they could really handle that much information about their home. I don't know if they could handle more than one button. I was like, oh, come on. Like, what am I supposed to do here? I'm a designer. I'm supposed to innovate, and I'm not going to change anything. I think that you think that these people are stupid. They're not stupid. They're just old. Um, and later in my life, I went on to do work, actually, in the space of 50 plus, And I had the best um, quote somebody sent to me, which is that people who are older just have a shallower on-ramp. The ramp it takes them to learn something new. And they said, unless you're old, they made the distinction. There's elderly people and there are old people. Old people are like, sweetie, I would love to talk to you about your cute little project. I'm going to be dead in two years. Right? They're like, I'm, I'm moving on. But elderly people are like, I can learn new things. It just takes me a little longer. Just make my ramp a little shallower. Don't make me go like this. Make me go like that. Which I really took to heart. Um, and so, uh, you know, tonight I just wanted to share a little bit about how I'm, I'm not directly in the healthcare space or, or elderly space anymore, but um, education has a lot of very interesting parallels to me. And it's funny that our consumer products get really <coughs> minimal and sexy and fair and expressive, and our other ones are not they're beige, very ergonomic. Um, interestingly, Seymour Powell designed this um, uh, concept phone for Nokia, and they also designed that. So like, it's, these designers are capable of doing really radical things, right? But not when it comes to the kind of chair that takes you up the stairwell in your home because you can't climb stairs anymore, mm -hmm. right? That's got to be beige, and I don't have a close-up anymore of this arm, and it has like, you know, somebody's put some real thought into the like four-way controls that are on the arm of the chair. That's probably where most of the design work went into. Uh, so it's kind of infuriating as someone that has a passion for this space and loves cool products to constantly meet the hammer of like, oh, but they can't handle it, or, you know, God, it's too expensive, or whatever, especially given all the numbers we just saw. So currently we think about things as being effective and um, reliable, and I need to see my slide. <laughs> 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 that on my slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> at the end of the day, your, your, function, um, your, your goal is to not take any risks. And someone actually brought this up to me. I gave a, an impassioned speech about medical device design at the um, device design day. Because right before I went on, somebody said to me, oh, medical devices, sounds so boring. And I was like, oh, for God's sakes, I'm going to do the call to arms for all of you. And it got me a lot, again, it got me a lot of attention. It just says there is a lot of energy in this space. We just have to tap into it. But someone also that day said to me, I can imagine being really scared. Like if I get the social networking bit wrong on my e-commerce site, <coughs> okay, the cart takes a little bit, no one dies. But like you feel like you're taking on this personal responsibility in a medical space that like you might hurt somebody. That is true. There are many safeguards in there. You are not alone in that. So do not be afraid to take risks. And in fact, if you read about behavior change, every action you take has an intended or unintended consequence on behavior change. Right? Just very subtle things. I give you the hot drink, and then I introduce myself, and you like me, and I give you the cold drink, and I introduce myself, and you don't like me. Right? Like we all read the Malcolm Gladwell papers. We respond to very subtle things. So to think that you are you know, having no effect is to, you're just kidding yourself. So like, why not be thoughtful about it and harness that passion and intention and do something instead of like, they can't handle it. Now, 
what's a useful way to think about this? Because I got really trapped in the like ergonomics. Okay, well, ergonomics. I can focus on ergonomics. I can focus on simplicity. But they're not super inspiring. They weren't super organizing for me as a designer. And so I, I came up with this um, re somewhat recently, um, after actually having been in the education space, because there's so many similarities. And really, the way I think about things that are intended to help people live better, right? And I, when I say live better, I don't necessarily mean like cure cancer or any of that. I mean uh, be autonomous, have mastery, have all those things that undergird beha true behavior change and like, you know, realizing our true potential. Um, and I would talk about them as bionics, antennae, and hives. I'll do a little bit on those. Um, and this is a little more useful to me, I find, as a product person um, than kind of ergonomics and simplicity. So bionics. Very simply, bionics is what therapy are you delivering? In education, like what reading intervention are you doing? What cast are you putting on? What nurse are you sending in? And uh, bionics has come a long way, right? Like uh, he can't even compete with people with legs because he's too good, right? Bionics are, is no longer a ghetto thing. Like how you guys are all wearing eyeglasses, those are bionics, right? So we're already starting to change our mentality about what it means to need help which is awesome. So I think we all probably understand that part pretty well. Probably like, you know, listening to Andy's um, spiel, which I often have that example up here too. You know, you start from that problem-focused place and you get to the place of what, what problem am I solving, what solution do I give? Awesome. So the next up is antenna. And what I mean by antenna, and this is maybe a little subtle, but in a world where um, sensors are so cheap, you're all carrying around compasses, um, accelerometers, gyroscopes, microphones, light meters, um, proximity meters in your pockets right now. These things cost nothing. It costs nothing to harness them. What are you doing to use that information to inform your product? Because again, if you're trying to help someone who is incapacitated in any way, you, they need extra senses. And so again, go back to the bionics. Why not think about this as making them James Bond? Like, you, your product makes them hear better, see better, whatever. It also helps relay that information to other people. We'll talk about in a minute. And so, it, to think about this example right here is, um, when I was at Lunar Design, they worked on a, the cyber knife, which is a radiotherapy treatment. So you can treat a tumor very carefully with high doses of radiation because it is very, it's a robot that's very focused. The way that protocol would work is you would breathe in, hold your breath, Get your tumor. Okay, breathe out. Take a breath. Uh, I don't, my mom just went through breast cancer. Like this is not a good thing. It's not a human place to put people in, right? It's already a lot of anxiety. So Lunar just said, well, we could put LED lights that track the breathing, and then the robot would know when they're breathing and could compensate accordingly. Right? Why not just use the antenna to make the thing smarter and reduce the complexity? Or this is Proteus. Um, I, I always I wonder how real these guys are. And if anyone knows, I'd love to talk to you. It's a great idea, though. Like, yeah, just ingest the thing. And it'll give you real data from inside the body. That's an awesome idea. And then what I also love is like, and don't go build a custom device. And I think you guys are all smart enough not to do this now. But maybe three or four years ago, people were not that smart. Um, syndicate the UI out to all the little computers we're already carrying around. Uh, I, that was actually one of my favorite things too, working for the um, glucometer people. They couldn't get a, they couldn't make the device keep time accurately for more than three months. They're like, oh yeah, we can't really figure out how to get a clock to keep time. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you making consumer electronic devices? Like stick to the biomedical shit. Like just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and then highs. Maybe some of you see. This. <laughs> So we don't have to the whole Kaiser ad, but I just love that. Because, I mean, we've all been there, right? You're like, dude, I've been seeing you for 10 years. You're telling me you don't have the data on file? Like, come on, what year is it? So people have come to expect that you're part of a hive, that your thing is part of a hive, that it talks to other information systems intelligently, 
using those bionics and those antenna and giving you the right information and others the right information. And if you don't, um, if you don't honor that, you're kind of breaking the social contract, which is why this ad is so funny. And I bring that up because it, I was, we were just talking about this over there, but I'm not saying like share to Facebook, right? That's not a hive. You're not like I have cancer. Share to Facebook. No, no, no. <laughs> you might. Dude, I had a really hard time. I don't know if any of you follow um, Jenny from Boing Boing. She's been going through breast cancer on Twitter, and she's living her life out loud doing it, and she gets a ton of emotional support. She's a very specific person. Most people won't do that. There's a time and a place for a virtual support for people who know you, but there's also a time and a place for anonymous connection around an idea that has not been realized on the internet. And maybe there's a fundamental flaw there, but I just believe that there's got to be a better way to be doing it, and we could all be doing it a lot better than we are. Um, and if anyone has any ideas about that or reasons why it's not working, um, there's also some in-person stuff that probably could help inform all of that. But I would love to bridge the digital in-person divide around how are we sharing information and getting that support. Um, and then, you know, this is a short version of, a, of this talk that I've given before, and usually what I, I do with a kind of a different crowd is, is say, and all of that is nice, but I want to beat you over the head with the idea, though, that you're still designing a consumer product. I got to, to be mentored by Cordell Ratzloff, who worked on OS X and led Frog, and he's an awesome man, and he would say, Gretchen, people don't stop being consumers when they go to work. Doctors don't stop being consumers when they go to work. People don't stop being consumers and their patients, right? You're designing a consumer product whether you like it or not. So it has to be beautiful. It has to be emotionally resonant. It has to be provocative. And when I say kinesthetics, it should, um, I call it the no-look pass. Like if you're designing a glucometer, um, I want to be able to like bolus myself and do stuff without having to physically go here, right? So how can you make something that supports the body that is kinesthetic, that is moving in gross movements, that is making large adjustments and not simply fiddling? Because uh, that is just as important to adoption and, and um, moving the needle in innovation than all of the bionics in the world, um, as evidenced by adoption of any other consumer products. So with that, I think I'm probably out of time. <laughs> and I will take any and all questions. All right. Great presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, do, you have, do you have any thoughts on the user interface for uh, specifically like all digital products, right? So um, clearly by simple affordances, things like that. But um, are we going to sort of more modern designs or like, like how comfortable are people with that? Like, yeah, it's that's an interesting question. So the tendency toward oversimplification and the one button thing is a trap. Um, that said, when you look at the simplicity that, that is afforded by a mobile first approach, like I've even seen that in things I've done, it's that level of simplicity, which is my, it's not that I have one choice, but I don't have a million choices and my choices are organized. Um, I think it's literally the phone that imposes that hierarchy in a way that like the widescreen does not. Um, and, you know, aesthetics, it's tough because it's, you know, it's tough to generalize for any population, but um, I think you actually, uh, it was the Wabi Sabi, Wabi Sabi, 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 um, Sabi product, yeah. Sabi product like uh, S-A-B-I, it's like a high fashion um, accessories thing. They do a nice job of like, it's not Alexander McQueen, you know, it's not cutting edge fashion, but it's tasteful. And um, just go back to that orthopedic shoe. Like, these are people who, well, they're your parents. Like, they're not fat on my mom's fashion list, but your mom maybe not, right? Like, they're not all fashion list people. They're not all, um, and even my mother would appreciate an aesthetic point of view. So just like any product, aesthetics, I would say, is have your own point of view and have a reason for having it. And in terms of UI, have the simplicity be on the order of, um, three selections or five selections, and then do it in the mode of reflecting on giving them information, right? So offer some choices, and then before you make the next choice, give them something to respond to, because that's that shallow ramp. You can't expect that they know the next step to take, if that helps. Great. <coughs> Very interesting question. Your thoughts about, um, you had ideas in comparison of how the US does this, 
compared to other people. Because my sense, I'm from the UK, I come here and it feels, compared to Europe, America is much more of a young, focused, mm -hmm. got to be sexy, got to be young society. Have you kind of come across other cultures or, or, or have an opinion about how the US kind of fits in the rest of the world and, and this kind of thinking? I've done a little bit, and my husband has done more. Um, and so all I can say is, um, when I went to Japan, and I worked on that same blue cometer thing, <laughs> what I found was interesting is there the reaction, to, it, it was an aesthetic difference. Um, and it's, uh, it, you can see it in consumer products. Uh, techie was more acceptable, was more valued. Um, it had a, you know, for us, simplicity connotates value connotates cachet, and the opposite is true, I found, I mean, in my very limited experience there. Uh, but I think the real difference is, like, in the method of payment between Europe and the U.S., like, the idea that it's, well, we could go on. <laughs> the insurance companies have, you know, the, in order to get paid back for your COGS in this country is very difficult, and that is less um, difficult in Europe, so a lot more innovation happens there. It has works at GE, and, like, France is their biggest customer because they will spend the money to buy the real innovation, and then it's the trickle down to us poor Americans. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't have a ton of experience there. Yeah. How do you think about distribution design for elderly or aging population? Fantastic question. Distribution for, I, I have no idea. I wish I did. Um, you know, other than to hear, I'm glad to hear that there's mass market media going on about this. If this is 44% of the population, like, enough. Let's see the ads. Let's see the major TV spots. Let's see the Oprah. Let's see the Ellen. Like I would get to those people that are movers, uh, because otherwise it's just always going to be the ghetto of you know orthopedic shoes. Mm -hmm. Wish I had some people up there. Sorry. We should talk to you guys in interested in fashion because in New York we're connecting now with the Parsons School and they're doing a design for aging populations class and we're helping them organize a fashion show of fashion and designers both with um, clothing and accessories, since if you're walking down the street and you're carrying a cane, that's an accessory. So um, we should talk to you guys and try to get you to be part of that if you're in the fashion. Oh. <laughs> this kind of goes off the back of this, but how do you think about um, designing products for people who don't want to be thought, who don't want to be thought of as old <laughs> in the first place? Um, well, I don't know. I've worked on stuff for kids who have learning disabilities or people with vision impairment, and there's a little bit of like you you can think that about yourself for some time, and then you cannot. But like, I don't know. Do I think of myself as this person? Like, I kind of resisted the iPhone for a long time because <laughs> everyone had it, and I didn't want to be one of those people. And, and here I am. So I I don't. I guess I wouldn't approach it from an it's for old people. And again, you can use your own words, but I love the distinction of old and elderly. Some people have reversed those. But, um, you know, like, um, there's a temptation to be overly, like, matriarchal or patriarchal. And I just would avoid that trap, right? Like, they're just people. So just try to empathize with them as people who want to be people and like their age doesn't really matter. They have certain issues, but like I don't necessarily, you know, like I'm having a babies now or whatever, brides or teens or, you know, like you think of them as people who are getting married and struggling with like not wanting to get ripped off. Like find that part of the person you're identifying with, which is like I want to be stylish but still address my hip problem or whatever. It's not that I'm old. Like that's, that's tangential. We talk a lot about like a needs-based approach as opposed to an age-based one. So it's, you could have a need, you know, I could fall tomorrow and I could be needing, you know, assistive devices and that has nothing to do with my age, but it's a need. And similarly later, you know, if someone could be 50 or they could be 90 or they could be 80. So I think if you address the need and the person, um, <coughs> that you can kind of have age dropped into the background. There's a question there the back. Actually, it was, it was, I think you answered it. My question was really about um, how much research do you do into the heyday of the person you're serving. For example, you know, uh, my mother, although she, she, she was one of the I am woman, hear me roar, and divorced in the 70s, right? She divorced my father in the 70s. There's a lot of those people coming about their um, personal social height in, in the 70s and that kind of thing. And so I think there's a, I, I see of the people that I know, and this is totally anecdotal, but Mm -hmm. of those that I meet and those that I know now are very much interested and I'm I'm in, in sales right. so I do B2B kind of very that's my thing right. um, 
that there's a lot of this harking back to the heyday and that the design might target at least that in that direction right. and of course it would be in, it would be uh, unique to the country or the yeah, I mean, whether I would locate it in a specific time or not, mm -hmm. um, part of helping someone be autonomous is, you know, they're not going to get them back to when they were 20 or no, but I mean, before they lost their vision. Design appeal, you know. But yeah, I mean, I think you want to celebrate the, the you want to speak to the time when they understood themselves as fully realized and you want to celebrate that and that, right. you know, you don't have to distinguish between the fact that their full realization might be somewhat diminished now. Like, it's going to happen to us all. Mm -hmm. So, like, you don't have to be afraid of it, but I would position it more at um, the capabilities and the upside and the storytelling about that rather than, you know, hey, you have to get ready for a new and life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. I'm um, just uh, slightly lifting on that a little bit. Did you have any um, opinions about the Apple design interface when there's there seems to be this sort of slightly schizophrenic um, discussion between the people who are inserting these things that looks a bit like a real piece of notepad, whereas a leather embossed. We're going to go to the skeuomorphism debate. Yeah, yeah just, just a very quick quick perspective um, on that. It's useful. It's useful because you're tapping in. If you are and can you know, tap into a useful visual spatial metaphor, that's great. Um, I think Apple's getting hit with it right now because of the Corinthian leather, green felt, game center, yeah. notepad. It's extraneous and there are visual details that are, you know, attempting to evoke something and are maybe seeming a little bit probably dated already. Yeah. Um, I don't know, as a designer, I love the Metro, which is the uh, window, the, what is it, Windows Mobile, the terrible branding. Modern interface. Surface, <laughs> surface, thank you. The tiles, the type driven, like as a designer, I love it, but I've watched like the layman look at that and be like, oh, mm. dude, I have no time. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's a good take. Okay. Um, final thought? Yeah. Oh, I just have one question. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, there's going to be a lot of new products coming up, and there's uh, a lot of people who need them, <coughs> and they don't know they need them yet. So in marketing, and designing these products that they don't know they need and we'd like to supply them with. What, what thoughts do you have on that? Oh, well, um, I talked about the chocolate chip and the broccoli, right? If your thing is you need to eat more broccoli, you need to think about what's the chocolate chip cookie. Um, or the cheddar cheese you put on your broccoli, as my CEO, who doesn't like cookies, says. So again, I would, I would position it as what is this thing doing for you? first and then you know the, the ancillary benefits that they don't know that they need I would downplay and if you don't have that story you don't have a product yet because otherwise you really are you're going to have to go you're going to have to go get Mr. Cohen to get you introduced into care living facilities and th right. sell through that channel and I mean my very limited experience they're difficult expensive problematic okay. all, right. all right we're done thank you very much